Um, first of all, Ted, I just want to, I, I want, everyone kind of knows who you are, but I'm, I put together a little introduction for you. Um, obviously, Ted is one of the trainers for the, the three-week yoga retreat, um, but I, I did some research on you, and he, he really is, um, he's a yoga teacher. He's been teaching yoga for over 10 years. Um, he is a fitness trainer. He's an endurance athlete. Like, do you, are you one of those runners that runs in the heat, like 110 degrees? Do you run in the desert? Is that what an endurance? Um, endurance athlete just means going a long distance. Long so, distance. Okay, like uh, 100. Yeah. 100 miles. Yeah. Right. So running, biking. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow. Okay. So your daughter might have that in her blood. It, it might That's be right. in her genetics, right? Um, he's an entrepreneur. He's an avid traveler, a philanthropist. Um, he's a loving father, a loving husband. Um, he's a former elite adventure racer. Um, he played lacrosse at UCLA. He be, um, he's the founder of uh, Adventure Yoga Retreats, which sounds so awesome. It's, it's a company that organizes premium travel adventures that enriches lives and inspire people to perform at their highest level. I thought, wow, that's awesome. Um, he's a co-creator and featured in Tony Horton's P90X2 Yoga Sequence. He is the designated yoga teacher for the Tour de France, winning professional cycling BMC racing team. And he's got his own yoga series on exercise TV. So um, you have quite the resume, Ted, and I so appreciate you being here. Um, Thank you. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to let Ted talk, but he's, I guess tonight he's going to be talking about nutrition and, you know, maybe some ways that, you know, maybe there's a lot of myths out there and a lot of, a lot of things that we're, a lot of, um, a lot of things that we read and then the next day we read something else. So um, what, what are your thoughts on nutrition? Uh, my thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first, before I, before I share my thoughts, I, I wanted to share with you guys something that I just found. I'm sorry. I'm just I'm going to pull it up here momentarily. This is a study. So there, there's, an, there's an organization called... Let's see, stand by. Food Insight. And uh, Laura, we can put a link to this later. But it's basically the, um, the International Food Information Council, essentially. And it's foodinsight, I-N-S-I-G-H-T dot org. Mm -hmm. So they just came out with this, this um, release uh, about nutrition information. And the title is Nutrition Information Abounds, But Many Doubt food choices okay so some of the highlights basically are that uh what was i reading here uh eight of ten people surveyed so they surveyed a, a, a thousand and two people which gives you in, in research and science that gives you basically a microcosm of the whole macrocosm of the that's enough people to give you to say x percent of the country does whatever so eight in 10 people, 78%, say that they encounter a lot of conflicting information about what to eat and what to avoid, okay? More than half of those people, 56%, say that the conflicting information makes them doubt the choices they make. I mean, it's like proof is in the pudding right here, right? So, so for me, first of all, you guys, thank you very much for having me, Lord, thanks for having me. Um, I, uh, I grew up in some of you guys near Long Island. I played lacrosse at uh, uh, William Floyd High School, exit 68 off the LIE. So <laughs> that's, uh, <clears throat> that's my hometown. And now I live in Malibu, California. I don't know how I got here, but <laughs> I, I do like it here. Um, and now I use lacrosse balls for something different, for like foam rolling my, uh, my situation, my cramps and my soreness. But anyway, um, so for years I had – um, you know, I've been an athlete. I ran my first marathon in 2000 and that was kind of, I grew up playing lacrosse and football and baseball and then sort of just stayed fit. But then in 2000, I always say I got suckered into doing my first marathon. I had been doing yoga for a few years and only did yoga, gave up running, gave up going to the gym and lifting weights or any kind of exercise. Then I felt like I wanted to add a little cardio. I love running. So, uh, I started doing that. And like I said, got suckered into doing this marathon. And that was in 2000. Then I did my first triathlon, same year. Then I, the company that was putting on this little mini sprint, turns out it was Malibu Triathlon. 
And uh, this little mini sprint triathlon was also putting on an adventure race. Adventure racing, if you don't know, is multi-sport, like a triathlon, swim, bike, run. Adventure racing is mountain biking, kayaking, trail running, but also navigation. So there's a team. You typically do it in teams of, you know, three or four or five. And everybody does the whole entire race. And the races will take you like a sprint race will take two to five hours. And all the way up to, I don't know if some of you remember, the Eco Challenge, which was a big race that was like 400 miles. And it would take five to 10 days to finish. And people would race through the night. And you'd basically sleep for two hours. or So I never did anything that extreme. But I would do two to three day races. So we'd race through the night. We'd start at 630 in the morning and finish like at noon the next day. And you'd be basically be going nonstop for hours and hours and hours. And so for me, back then, when I got into that 2001, two, three, four in the marathon, I immediately thought, well, what I'm putting in my, my system is the fuel. So I have to start to become more aware of the fuel that I'm putting in my, my engine, right? My engine is is my, my body essentially. And that's what is going to propel me forward. And as an athlete, I wanted to make sure that I was utilizing the most efficient forms of uh, food. Now, back then, that was 17 years ago, uh, there's a book called the Triathlete's Training Bible written by a guy named Joel Friel, who's kind of a famous uh, triathlon coach from Boulder. <clears throat> and he, I remember going to the nutrition chapter and the first sentence in the nutrition chapter basically says, welcome to the world of eating whatever you want. He's like, there's been nights where I've sat down and had a quart of ice cream, but I knew I was going to burn it off the next day. So long story short, that guy no longer thinks that way <laughs> because he understands that all that sugar, even though you could take it in and yes, you could burn it off, it's going to turn into fat and give you a heart attack and, and increase your cholesterol. And it's just not a good thing to do. So back in the 70s, there was also a guy named Timothy Noakes, who's around still today, who wrote a book called The Lore of Running. That was all about carb loading. So we used to think about, you know, oh, the night before the race, you got to take in all this pasta and carb load, and then you go do a marathon or half marathon or whatever, and you're going to use that fuel. Well, turns out that's not really healthy for you either. And so what I know now to sort of make this kind of very short and this is my experience and then i'm happy to kind of answer some questions from the really yoga retreat i got i got my copy of the clean eats book here but um so for me uh when i turn 40 i'm 46 now and when i turned 40 i thought okay well it's time for me to like get some blood work done i haven't been to a doctor in 20 years and uh, you know I, I basically take care of myself and always felt healthy always felt energetic and um, and never really had any weight issues or anything like that. And, and, and I performed really well during races and stuff. And I would kind of dial in certain things and I'd figure out what sports drinks I needed and all that. But uh, when I turned 40, I thought, okay, it's time to get blood work. Because even though I feel really good, I don't know, you know what's going on on the inside. And my younger brother, I have three brothers, and one of them was diagnosed with cancer when he was seven years old. So I know that like, something like that he's fine now by the way he has two kids and survived and, and and he's okay but um i mean he's a little bit of a punk but that's a different story no uh so anyway we just don't know right i mean we didn't know what was going on and and all of a sudden this is a blood he had leukemia so it's a blood disorder so i just always had that in the back of my head and and uh and i took me because i was probably in denial for a couple of years it took me almost three years i think my first round of blood tests was uh when I was 43. So 2014, my birthday is October 7th. Um, and uh, so it was sometime in, in, in 2014 that I got this blood work done and it was a functional medicine doctor. And she said, she brought me in. And so we, she, she had a, a, um, a deal with a lab that's now called True Health Diagnostics. And it basically, they take your lipid panels, your lipid panel is your LDL, HDL, triglycerides, all that sort of stuff. They take your LDL and then they break it down deeper. So typically, if you look at your cholesterol panel, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, that stuff, and your cholesterol is on the higher side, the doctor will just tell you, most doctors will just say, oh, your cholesterol is a little bit high, we have to do something. Either you got to change your lifestyle and exercise and eat better, 
or they'll give you a statin. A statin is going to help decrease your cholesterol. The problem with statins are that, and we're finding that, this out more and more, that they're not really good for you in the long run. So I think they cause like stress or they cause heart attacks or I don't know that I just, it's something's going on with statins that's not good. And I'm sure more research will come out about that. But anyway, my cholesterol was on the higher side, but it wasn't to the point, it wasn't like red. So the great thing about this particular lab is you'd have like a green number, a yellow number or a red number. So it was good because you were like, oh, I'm in the yellow zone. So it's not panic now. I've got to change everything, but I can work on it. So most of my stuff was, I had a couple of red things. I had some yellow things and I had some green things. And she said, I'm not, I wouldn't like if, and this is a, she's an MD, but she left UCLA medical. She, there was a little satellite UCLA medical place here. She left there because they were just forcing her to see more doc, more patients. She's like, I can't treat anybody by seeing them for five minutes. How can I possibly treat someone? So she's moved on, started her own practice and uh, she's a functional medicine doctor. And so she'll actually go through these labs with you and spend like an hour, right? Which is unheard of. She's fantastic. And anyway, so she said, look, you have some inflammation. It's nothing to be alarmed about, but it is some things that we can change because what, sh what it's showing is uh, that you have some inflammation in your adipose tissue, which is fat tissue. And I'm like, wow, wait, if you look at me, you, you'd go, this, this guy, so he's, he's fit. Like, he doesn't have any fat on his body. But what I, and then I started to look closer at what I was drinking and what I was eating. By the way, this is Cafe Latte Shakeology with a little green boost in my performance bottle because I know you guys are beach body people. So I just figured out, don't tell anyone this be, is. Ted, it better be. <laughs> performance, the performance people might be upset that I'm putting Shakeology in the bottle. But I, this bottle is way better than the, than the other. So shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so anyway, point is that, uh, that, I was not actually having beach body. I've known Tony Horton for 10 years, but I wasn't really consistently taking Shakeology or using beach body. Beach body performance wasn't even around at this point. I was taking other supplements that will remain nameless at the moment. <laughs> what I realized with these sport drinks that I was drinking and the way that I was eating is that I was overstimulating my pancreas. So to kind of boil this thing down, because there were a couple of questions of like, you know, can I eat dairy was one of the questions in the, on the, in the Facebook group today. And uh, another question was about menopausal women. That's a hormone situation. So that's a whole different thing. I'm not going to, I don't know enough about hormones and how they change. I haven't quite hit menopause yet. So I don't know exactly really what happened. But I do know actually from teaching yoga, this is a total aside, that I have so many women, not so many, but I have a lot of women who come, they're going through menopause and my class gets warm, it gets hot, just, you're sweating in class, I try to challenge people and some women who happen to be going through menopause would be like, I'm dying, I'm having a hot flash, I have to go outside. So it's, uh, I mean, I don't mean to laugh, you know, because I'm not ever going to experience that. But I understand, and my wife actually is reading a book. She would know more. My wife is a health coach and a chef, a healthy chef. She's got a blog that's fantastic. You should definitely link to her blog. Um, but she's, she's a, a, a resource probably <clears throat> more for that, for the hormone situation. And, but, but the ultimate point I'll get to, I think, will cover menopausal women along with everyone else. But anyway, so back to what I was doing. So what I was doing essentially on a run was, let's say I was going for a big 10 and a half mile run across the street from my house. There's a whole bunch of hills. I love them. They're great. If you find me on Instagram, you'll, you'll see all the trails out there. And, um, and I would have an open, a bowl of oatmeal and a banana, and then I, that would be my fuel for the run. And then I wait about an hour, and then I go do a nice long two hour run or you know whatever it was hour and a half and if i'm going for 45 minutes or even an hour i won't eat beforehand but if i'm going for longer than that 45 minutes then i'll then i'll want to eat at least this used to be the way so i'd have my oatmeal my banana and then wait like i said about an hour and then i that would be enough time for me to digest because i'd start the run slower then i'd have a pre-energizer uh, workout drink like the Beach Body Performance Energize, and uh, although the Beach Body Performance Energize, and this is not a commercial for Beach Body, but it could be, is much far superior product than what I was taking. Um, 
and I do use the Beachbody Performance Energize before my workouts. Not before yoga, because I don't think you need it before yoga, but definitely before, like Monday night, I'm still sore. We were all at Tony's house doing plyometrics, and, um, and I had it before that, because it's like a much bigger, stronger, harder workout. Before my runs, before a big bike ride, that kind of thing, I'll for sure have it. Anyway, so my previous drink, I would have my oatmeal, my banana, then I'd have my drink, then I'd go run. During the run, I'd stop and have a gel, and one of those little sport gels, and then I'd finish the run, and then I'd have a recovery drink. Not like the Beachbody Performance Recover, I'd have a, a first a muscle recovery drink, then I'd have something similar to the Beachbody Performance Recover, then I'd have lunch. Right? So all this is happening in the first few hours of the day. And what I learned after I got my blood work back, now that all seems good, healthy, right? It's just a few sport drinks. I'm working hard. I'm doing my thing. I'm having oatmeal, a banana. Then I'm having a nice big salad for lunch and a protein shake. Shouldn't be a problem. But the issue is that your pancreas can only process about 50 to 60 grams of carbohydrates per sitting or per hour, essentially. So your pancreas, just to kind of back up a little bit, um, sorry for the birds, but the, so the, the pancreas is what secretes insulin. Okay. So you take food in and your, your blood sugar starts to raise. Well, the pancreas, so the ins insulin, uh, glucose levels go up. So your insulin, the pancreas secretes insulin to help stabilize your blood sugar. Cause if your blood sugar goes too high, you start to get sh the shakes and it's, it's bad for you. If your blood sugar goes too low, then you can die essentially of a, of a diabetic coma. So people who have type one, so there's type one diabetes and type two diabetes. Just quickly type one, people don't have a functioning, properly functioning pancreas. So they have to have insulin injections. There's like a little patch thing that they have, a Dexcom that they have on their arm or their hip or wherever it is. And that actually Bluetooths to their phone. And then they can see every five minutes, they get a data point of where their blood is, their blood glucose level. So they can, they can monitor it and then take a little bit of juice or whatever they need to keep. That's type 1 diabetes. Type 2 people have just totally you know, demolished their pancreas from over-sugaring themselves that they, have, that they get type 2 diabetes. And that's way more controllable and reversible, whereas type one is not. Type one is something that you're born with, and it's just the way it is, and you have to really monitor it. But anyway, what we know in science is that your pancreas can only really handle about 50 to 60 grams of carbohydrates per hour, let's say, per sitting, okay? That's for the quote-unquote normal human being. It's not for everyone, but in general. For me, based on my genetics, I really should only be having about 30 grams per sitting. I don't even do that. But on a rare case, I'll do that. Like last night, probably. <laughs> but uh, we were at a friend's birthday dinner, and they, they made like lentil soup with potatoes, and then a big honking thing of quinoa with some beautiful roasted vegetables, and then a big cake. And I, like, I had to get rid of most of the quinoa. I had to not have the, the potatoes, and I had like a bite or two of the cake. So that's kind of my solution in a, in a group situation like that. Anyway, back to the pancreas and what's actually happening. So think about this, back to my run. If I had my oatmeal, that's 30-ish grams of carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. And I threw a banana on top, that's about 30 to 35. I can't have anything else. So if I eat that hour and then I have that drink, that drink that I was having had about 15. So I, if I have it within the hour, I'm overstimulating my pancreas. When you overstimulate your pancreas on a regular basis throughout the day because you're having sugary drinks and coffee and soda and too much bread and french fries and all this crap, what happens is your pancreas says, screw you, I'm done. Because the pancreas secretes the insulin and the body doesn't adjust. So the pancreas finally says, well, I'm getting more carbohydrates. I'm giving you more insulin. I'm trying to stabilize. You're giving me more carbohydrates. I'm giving you more insulin. I'm trying to stabilize. And then finally, the pancreas, think about it as like a bunch of grapes, becomes a bunch of raisins. And that is what's called type 2 diabetes. So that's really important to understand because most people in this country, in our world, live on carbohydrates. 
So we're going from a macro level. So you have macronutrients, carbohydrates, protein, and fat. That's macro, big picture, right? Micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, right? Stuff you get from superfoods. Oh, guess what? By the way, Shakeology stock full of micronutrients and, and really good stuff. So that's a cool thing. And most flavors, because I look at this stuff, most flavors have about 14 to 18 grams per serving of carbohydrates. So that's fine for me. I'll have this. It's now 3.22 my time. I, we started at, at three o'clock. I've had a couple sips. By the time I'm, uh, this will take me an hour, hour and a half. Like maximum, I'll have one of these in an hour and that's fine. I can handle that, no problem. So anyway, <clears throat> macro. And you got, your, you got your carbohydrates, you got your insulin. And what you have to be careful of is understanding. So I used to, I used to work, I used to work at this, this wellness retreat place and in the afternoon, I'd go and I'd pick up a nice bag of corn chips. And I think, oh, corn chips are healthy. It's just corn and, and some lime and some salt. And then I'd have an Arizona lemonade. An Arizona lemonade has like 70 grams of sugar or something like this, grams of carbs. And those, those little Hava chips that I thought were healthy had 44 grams. So that's 115, whatever, 110 grams of carbohydrates. On my drive, which is 15 minutes from my house to the wellness retreat center, thinking, oh, it's just an afternoon snack, no big deal, just a nice cold iced tea and potato chip and, uh, and corn chips, right? Better than potato chips, probably the same. Anyway, that's killing, I was killing myself essentially. And that's what is hard, I think, for people to understand. And that's why it's no surprise to me that there's a study that says eight in 10 people are confused because this information there's so much information you can do paleo you can do vegan you can do whatever there's all kinds of different things and then you know, when i was it's, there's pescatarian when i was in you know when i learned about food in ninth grade there was no such thing as being a pescatarian right it was like you're either a vegetarian or you ate a carnivore there was a lacto ovo vegetarian and there was ovo vegetarian so you ate dairy and but anyway, so I digress for a second. So the point is, I think the biggest thing, and this, this, is, this is why I spend this much time on it, is I, I really feel like it's important to understand the macro side first. And when I, so uh, to, to just bring it back to my blood work, so we showed higher cholesterol levels, we showed higher triglyceride levels, HDL was not as good as it could be. I got super strict because my wife basically gave me an ultimatum. She said, look, I don't want to bring a kid into this world knowing that the dad is going to get diabetes. And that was hardcore. Like for, I was like, wait a second, what do you mean? Like, I'm like a Mr. Cool guy, you know? I'm like, I'm fine, I'm fine. I've never seen a doctor. And uh, the bottom line is she, she hit it right, the nail right on the head. She's like, I, I'm, I'm not willing to bring someone into this world who, who, I, who might, whose dad might die in a few years. And I was like, all right, I got to do this. And by the way, I would also have like Starbucks chai tea. I would never do a unicorn. That's crazy. The Starbucks unicorn is crazy. But a Starbucks chai tea, which was like chai, and I get it with almond milk or soy milk or whatever, probably sweetened from Starbucks. Then the chai itself was that stuff. And there must be 50 grams of, of carbohydrates in there so just as another scale when you think about carbohydrates when i say that in in the in the world of a drink so let's say there's 50 grams of carbohydrates in that starbucks chai tea four it's i think it's like 4.5 grams or 4.2 grams or something like that of um carbohydrates equals one teaspoon of sugar okay so think about that for a second. If you had 50, if you had a, a drink that was your afternoon Starbucks chai tea and there were 50 grams of, of carbohydrates, sugar in there, that would be 12, almost 13 teaspoons of sugar, okay? So there's no way any of us would ever put 13 teaspoons of sugar into any drink that was not sweetened. I mean, right? There's no way anybody would do that. 
So this is the other thing where it's really tricky when it comes to fruit, which was another question asked earlier on the, on the post. So um, it gets tricky because, wait, I had a thought before I was going to go to the fruit. Um, and now I totally forget what it was about the teaspoons. Oh, yeah. So you're, you're lucky if you put like two, like in a coffee. I'll put one or two in a, in a, in a coffee if I'm going to have coffee. But anyway, so, so regarding fruit, you have to really look at, I, I look at the carbohydrate content. That's what I look at first. So I actually have a, a, a little list in the inside of my cabinet that shows me how much carbohydrates there are for each particular thing. And, and Laura, if you want, I can find that in my, if you just remind me and find that in, in my notes and I can send it, we can like post it in the, in the group. I think I'm sure it's a PDF I got from the lab and uh, it's really great because it gives you vegetables and fruits and how much like mangoes stop great. having mangoes uh, i don't ha i don't do bananas i haven't had a banana in two years i um i don't do mangoes i do berries i do blueberries i do strawberries it's like a half a cup or a cup of strawberries is like four grams of carbohydrates and it's just like the blueberries are so there's something called uh, resveratrol. Some of you may have heard of res resveratrol. It's good for aging. And everybody was like, oh my God, I'm going to drink my red wine because red wine has resveratrol in it. And it's going to help me age better. Well, blueberries have like four times the amount or some crazy number. It's like way more resveratrol in blueberries than there are in red wine. So I'd say lay off the red wine and have blueberries instead. But anyway, so, uh, so regarding fruits, it's deceiving because you want to make sure you're having the proper amount of fruits. Now, um, the proper fruits, you don't want to overstimulate the pancreas, right? I think that's the biggest thing for me. So, um, and this goes back to linking it all together for uh, the question about uh, um, menopausal women. The most important thing that we all understand, in my opinion, my humble opinion is that we are all an experiment of one. What's going to work for me may not work for you. And that's why I think this is great, right? This, if, you, if you look at this, this book, like some of, these, some of these recipes are fantastic. First of all, I don't eat chicken. And uh, so this, this is funny. And uh, they, I remember that they made this. Uh, when we were kind of like designing the whole thing and they were like, Hey, you guys, we want, we want one of, uh, we want you guys to pick a recipe and we'll put it in here and we'll name it after you. And then I gave them like a dry or like a roasted veggie salad. And I'm not even sure if it's in here, but at one point before this actually came out, they, 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 Oh yeah, here it is. The, the Ted power. So they made it, they made it salmon. They made it a salmon dish, but initially it was a chicken salad. <laughs> I was like, guys, I don't eat chicken. What are you going to do? So there's they, they, still a chicken salad in here. But anyway, I think this, all this stuff is really well balanced. So I think it's great. What I would say is you just have to be careful, in my opinion, about doing the carbohydrate things. So there's something, have, you guys heard about 23andMe? People heard about 23andMe? It's that genetic testing. So my wife and I just sent it in a while back. And... Um, and we haven't received the, the, uh, the information yet. This takes six to eight weeks. But basically, you, you spit in a little vial, and then you send it off, and then they, they give you your DNA. They basically kind of map your genome, essentially. Excuse me. And it tells you what you might be predisposed with. And, the, and they'll tell you if you have the gene that makes you predisposed to Alzheimer's or heart disease or stroke or whatever it is. And I already know because that blood work, when I did that initial blood work, we also did a genetic test for ApoE. So apolipoprotein E, there's apolipoprotein little a, there's apolipoprotein B. This is all when you take your LDL and HDL and cholesterol. You take the LDL and you break it down, eight different particles. <clears throat> so they could have named them different things, but they decided to just change the back number. So the ApoE, you might hear about if you start doing some research here, is a genetic marker, essentially, that has different alleles so that you get one from your mom, one from your dad. <clears throat> so two or three or four. So you can be a two, two, or you can be a two, three, or you could be a three, three, or you could be a three, four, or you could be a four, four. 
it used to be that if you were a four, four, you were a ticking time bomb. You were basically for sure going to get Alzheimer's if not drop dead by the time you were 50. And that's what they showed that, you know, people who are like, Oh my God, the guy just died. Why did he was, he was in great shape, 52 years old. He just dropped dead. He probably had, or she probably had this genetic thing. Now it doesn't necessarily mean that's going to happen, but I am a three, four. So that means I have a predisposition for heart disease and Alzheimer's. So I have to be super aware of that. So of course, I get the blood work done. It shows I have some higher cholesterol. It shows that I have this genetic marker. And thankfully, there's science that shows just because you have that. And by the way, here's another great little uh, talk. There's a TED Talk that just came out. So the TED Conference, I'm sure you guys have listened to TED Talks just happened a month ago in Vancouver. If you remember a movie a year ago or two years ago called Still Alice it was about a woman, I think it was Julian Moore, who uh, she was a woman who got Alzheimer's. And, and uh, so the woman who wrote that book, Still Alice, did a TED Talk about how to prevent Alzheimer's. And it's a fascinating TED Talk. So uh, Laura, if you want, we can put a link to that as well. But Anyway, um, so just because, and she mentions a study about nuns who happen to have some sort of, you know, gray matter or some, some sort of indicator in the brain that showed that they should actually have Alzheimer's, but they didn't have it. So one of the things that they say is like having community and, and having a purpose in life is one of the things to actually help you prevent Alzheimer's and obviously exercise and eating right and all this kind of stuff. So for me, I have to look at this information and I have to act accordingly. Thankfully, my doctor said, look, you can, you can, um, you can change this by your lifestyle. So you got to start looking at what sugars you're taking in, start going on to a more low carb diet, start going into a more high fat diet. And so of course, as the proactive person I am, <laughs> I started doing all the research and reading all the books and figuring all of this stuff out. And I stopped having oatmeal, stopped having bananas, got rid of all those sport drinks that I was doing. This happened to coincide with my, you know, I was already kind of doing this. And then, then we started doing the three week yoga retreat. That was, I guess we shot it. Uh, a year ago. Wow, that's so crazy. Um, so I had done this already. I was already already in my low carb phase. And I remember at, on set actually talking to people <laughs> uh, at lunchtime and they're having like big sandwiches. And I'm like, yeah, I don't really do bread anymore. So bread, I'll have like a little bite of bread as a vehicle for butter because it's good fat, the butter, right? And um, and we eventually, so, so your body adjusts. I lost a few pounds and then sort of, you know, came back to my normal weight, which is like 175, 178. On a rare case, I'll get down to 172 or three or 180, 181. And for me, it's just, you know, whatever it is. And I had my body fat tested, my body comp composition tested. And I thought, well, I don't know. I had no idea really like what's healthy or what's not healthy. And I went with my friend and He's like, you're going to be way leaner than me. I'm like, no, this guy's a little skinny twig guy. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm sure you're going to be way leaner than me. So they print out my, so they, we did a bod pod, which is like the spaceship thing that they put you in. And you got like just a pair of underwear on, your hat, hat is in a cap. It's, it's essentially um, uh, air displacement. So they can tell whether you have fat or bone structure or skin or whatever it is. And uh, he looks at the thing and he's like, wow. He's like, are you? are you training for something? And I was like, well, not, not really. I mean, I'm always well trained. And if I decide to do a race, I'll just train up for it. He's like, yeah, man. He's like, you're five and a half percent body fat. He's like, you shouldn't be any, he's like, this is, you're like, and this is what you would want as an athlete, like basically to be in competition at that point. And it wasn't because I was training. It was because I had been on this. I mean, yes, I was doing my normal training, but it's because I had been eating this way for a year, a year and a half. And the body just learns to burn fat a certain way. Now, obviously for women, it's different just as a, as a like for, for men, you don't want to go under 5% or under 4% or something. that's unhealthy. So five to like 15% is where you want to be as an athlete for a man. For a woman, I think it's like 15 to 25%. So just, just for, right. So that, that's like elite woman is like 
you know, athletes that look like they have no body fat, they're still 15 to 25% body fat just for a, 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 a gauge. Um, but anyway, so I was really happy about the fact that I really wasn't doing that much except changing my diet to have this great result. So that's kind of my, my sort of big like overall story of how I got to be where I am now. Oh, one final thing uh, is that I did those first tests in 2014. I kind of didn't really do much until 2015 or what was it, 2013? I forget. Anyway, it was 2014, I think, that I started to like really go on the diet in the end of 2014. And I got the test again in 2015 and things dropped like the, the cholesterol came down. LDL dropped uh, like 10 or 12%. I forget. HDL went up 10% and the triglycerides went down 10 or 12%. So like, and then the following year, same thing. The bad stuff went down. It got better. The good stuff went up. So LDL is bad. It went down. Perfect. HDL went up. Triglycerides, bad. You want them to go down. And all that was happening only because I was started watching my carbohydrate intake. Now, most of, the, most of what I eat is vegetables. I do eat eggs and I do eat fish once in a while. I don't do chicken or red meat at all, but I haven't done that in 15 years you know, or more probably. Um, and we could go into a whole story about that, but we don't have to now. So anyway, that's just kind of how I got to where I am with what I eat. And so I would say I'm mostly vegetarian and fish maybe now probably two to three times a month, depending. And we usually don't bring, we don't cook fish in the house. So we're always eating vegetarian in the house. Uh, eggs, there's eggs in the house. But um, if we go out, I'll eat and I'll have a nice piece of salmon or something like that. Um, and then dessert wise, here's, the, I don't really do desserts anymore. I do, I'll have a nice piece of dark chocolate. And dark chocolate is kind of my, my treat to myself that I'll have. And, and, and there's a brand, um, you can get it at Whole Foods. It's um, uh, green and blacks, 85% dark chocolate. So it's really bitter. And 80, anything I think above 73% is really the healthier chocolate. So next time you're going to go have some chocolate and uh, look at how much it don't have any milk chocolate, just go to dark chocolate. And then make sure it's above 73% cacao. That's kind of what you want there. So anyway, things were looking up for me and they continue. I haven't tested this year. I'm going to do a test soon and, uh, and, and look forward to seeing those results. I would imagine it'd be the same. I'd be very surprised if, if, uh, if it either would stabilize or continue to, to, to get better. So anyway, that's, that's kind of, for, for me, what, um, what's been happening and, and over the last few years and why I have a very specific case. So my recommendation would be, first, you can start having more vegetables. Like this, my wife wrote a book called The 14-Day Nutrition Reset, and she is like 30 different vegan recipes in there. And one of the concepts that she talks about in the book is... Uh, crowding out bad stuff. She, she's like, I'm not telling anybody to take away anything because then all of a sudden you get into this like, well, I want my, I want my food. No, you can't have your food. I want my food, right? And so she said, instead, just start eating more good stuff. And as you get, fill up on good stuff, then you know, maybe the bad stuff will start to go away. That's one thing. Another thing is now there are days there's a lot of talk about intermittent fasting. So I've learned a lot more of this over the last few uh, months. And uh, one thing that I would say is if you can get your eating within 12 hours or lower per day. So for instance, if you wake up in the morning and you have a coffee first thing, I don't recommend that because it's too acidic. I'll have water first thing and then I'll have some tea. And then I'll usually, if I'm going to have a coffee, it'll be in the afternoon, uh, like around like noon or one or something like that. Just, just, and I sip it for a couple hours. <laughs> but um, anyway, so my recommendation is that you limit your food intake, including drinks if you can, but at least solid food to, to 12 to uh, 10 hours a day, 10 to 12 hours a day. Meaning like if you get up and you had breakfast at eight, you can eat dinner at six, but don't eat again, you know, or eat dinner six or seven, right? Don't eat again 
for hours. And there's a lot of science behind this. Uh, and, and because what they're showing is that when you do a, a longer fast, intermittent fasting, essentially it sort of kills off a lot of the bacteria. So it's actually it, what used to happen back in the day years ago was that we we would have a bunch of food and then we wouldn't have food for a week or, or, or more. And the body would fight off everything and, and then you'd start to feed it again and it would kind of rebuild. So that same process happens. And if you do this intermittent fasting, supposedly that happens. Um, I, I like how I feel when I don't eat very much. There's also calorie restriction is a, is a lot. And I'm not saying to, um, to force yourself to eat little. And, and I, I, don't like, I don't like feeling strained. But if you can just kind of train yourself, think about that. Think about training. Uh, if you can train yourself to just kind of eat less, and I bet we'd all be fine if we ate thirty percent less than actually what we what we take in. That's for sure. Um, so those two things crowd out the bad stuff with good stuff. And then if you can limit your your intake, your eating, and this is except for water, but um, just within. 10 to 12 hours each day. So it's a little bit tricky. I mean, it takes effort to do that because you have to finish dinner early or you have to not have breakfast and sometimes skip breakfast. Um, but, um, but those are two things and obviously more organic and more veggies best. But, um, but that's it, I, I think, for me at the moment. But I'm happy to answer questions. Um, so just to answer the questions I know that were there, the menopausal thing, is a hormonal thing so i can't really speak to that specifically the only thing i can say is maybe do a little bit of research and figure out what works for you because if the, those uh women who who go through menopause it's you know certain things are gonna are gonna work that didn't work before and certain things may not work that that used to work so it's really this kind of we're all like a, a living experiment so the, the only thing I can say is, is if something triggers you or you feel like something like wakes you up and you're trying to go to sleep, obviously don't do that the next day. I mean, that's, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have any more specific information, but think of yourself as an experiment, right? That's one thing. And then um, the dairy question, the dairy question, um, I'm okay with dairy. I, we don't really do any whole milk or 2% milk. We do almond milk or coconut milk here in the house. I will in my coffee put a little half and half. So I just have a little kind of splash of that. I'm okay with dairy if it's from a decent source uh, because there's fat in there. So ultimately we know, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but there, there's plenty of research out there that just says good fats are good. Oil, like olive oil and nuts and seeds and uh, avocados like those are all good things to eat even uh, cashews right even though they're chock full of calories and, and and fat they're still good because ultimately you want your body to sort of burn fat you know you don't want to completely be reliant on the carbohydrates all the time because then you'll crash if you don't have them but if you're relying on the fat then it's okay because you can go all day like the fact that i have Five and a half percent body fat means at 178 pounds, let's just say 180 basically, that means I have nine pounds of fat. Think about that. If you held a whole big ball of fat in your hands and it was nine pounds, that's what I have on my body. And you're like, where the heck is all that? But it's in there because if you like slice through the muscle, you see the little white layers of like fat. That's fat. So it adds up over time. So there's plenty of fuel to get. When you're, if, if you're going to start burning fat. So you just lower that carbohydrate intake and move over. So I'm okay with some dairy as long as it comes from a good source, not like, you know, steroid pumped cows and all that sort of stuff. So if you can get some organic stuff, that's probably better. Um, and then the fruit thing we went through, I would say stick to berries. Those are the three questions that I saw. Happy to answer any others if, uh, if there are any. Okay. Does anyone, I just wanted to make a, like an observation. Um, you know, I, I did the three week yoga retreat. This is my third round. And I don't know if it was the, the lack of dairy or, you know, eating so many vegetables or stopping. I noticed my body leaned down like dramatic. And like what you were just saying, like you stopped, you know, you, you started limiting your carbs, you started eating differently. And I, I noticed a difference in my body within like nine weeks, like yeah. 
husbands, especially my midsection, which I never thought I had two kids. I'm 48. I just thought, oh, you know, it is. Yeah. But I, I did see a, a big difference in my midsection. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm well, happy. yeah, I'm, I mean, for sure. I, I, that's amazing. Congratulations. Right? It's, it's, to me, there's, here's another thing. It's funny because I remember watching you guys do the three week yoga retreat test group. And we've had obviously thousands of people do the program already, but it was fun to watch you guys go through the whole experience and to watch the, the amount of people who are losing weight because you would never think that doing 30 minutes of, of yoga is especially like Venus is weak is not that tough, right? I mean, faith is, it's not like a big workout where you're like sweating, you know, it's, it's, I mean, and Elise is a little bit more challenging and then mine is a little bit more challenging, but still it's not like you're like doing 22 minute hardcore, you know, or insanity or right. I mean, it's just, but the bottom line is it, it's the, the, what the truth is, is you can't exercise away a bad diet. It doesn't really, it's so much more diet than it is exercise. The fact that you're paying attention and moving for a half an hour a day is great. <clears throat> but what's way more important is the diet. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's why eight of 10 people are confused. And that's why it's so hard because people think, oh, if I exercise, I think you think of it this way, exercise is only going to get you to a place where you're more aware. And then you still have to actually make the choices and the decisions to eat better. Does anyone else have any question? Anyone? You know what? Is the, what was the name of your wife's blog and, and the uh, name of her book? Oh, yeah. So her blog is called delectableyou.com. Uh, D E L E C T A B L E Y O U.com. And her book is on there. It's called The 14 Day Nutrition Reset. It's an ebook. It's actually a big file. So if you decide to get it, I think it's like 10 bucks or something. But if you decide to get it, give it a minute to download because uh, we haven't made it the smaller file yet. So, <laughs> uh, but there's some great recipes in there and, and she's a great writer and her blog is just totally follow her blog. She it's uh, recipes for food and for life. Mm -hmm. And so she always has some, and she's, since we had Madison, she has uh, what's called diastasis. I don't know, diastasis recti. I don't know if some of you guys know that it's when you have a baby the, uh, for most women, the abdomen splits in half. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like 70% of women, after the baby comes out, the abdomen goes back and it comes back together. The two, so you have your abdomen and then it splits, right? Because the baby comes out that way. And the, the two sides of the abdomen come back and they, and they work together as one. And then for 30% of the people, it doesn't actually come back. Mm -hmm. And she had a very extreme case. She's kind of petite and the baby basically went straight out. You know how some, some women have kind of, they, I think they say like boys are little, kind of rest a little higher, girls a little lower or whatever. Anyway. Madison basically went straight out. So her abdomen split and she's been dealing for the last 14 months still. So anyway, she writes all about, you know, whatever she's going through. It's, it's really brilliant. I love, I love her, obviously she's my wife, but, <laughs> but, um, but some of the stuff is, is great. So anyway, check it out. And uh, yeah, delectable you .com. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And she has a YouTube but, channel, which you on, um, sorry. Um, yeah. She, you'll see if, if you follow, I'm her. sorry. No, no. Uh, she does all these little videos. I'm her cameraman. So <laughs> she does all these little recipes. So there's tons of little cam uh, videos that she has on different recipes. And I'm the guy in the back behind the camera. <laughs> anyway, sorry, go ahead. What was that? Christina? Um, I was a, a quick question about the fruit. Where do the grapes fall in the carb thing? Are grapes high in carbs? Yeah, they are. Um, you know what? There's actually a, a great... <laughs> You can, you can definitely, um, it's funny, I recognize that accent. <laughs> uh, There's a lot of them on this call. Oh, New Yorker, yes. <laughs> I, I love it. Uh, let's see, how many, so I'm typing this into Google. How many carbs oh. are in grapes? And then it immediately shows you this kind of very cool, I don't know if you can see that, but this is a very cool sort of graph, right? And it's like six, and then you can even, you can even um, change the thing. So it says grapes, one cup has 16 grams. So for me, I'd say, okay, 16 grams, one cup, but that's probably, I don't know, 12 grapes. So if you were going to have a dinner, 
and it was going to be pasta. <laughs> and like, let's say you're going to have pasta primavera <laughs> and you're going to have, so you've already <laughs> probably up there in the, in the carbohydrate content. And then you're like, well, I'm going to just, I'm going to be good. I'm just going to have grapes for dessert. And you might be able to, but if you had like salmon and salad and then you want to have grapes, go for it. Right. Cause you haven't had any carbs mm-hmm. in the, in the salmon or the salad. So I would say, you know, mm-hmm. they're fine. Just, just don't do dried fruit fruit. So raisins are dried grapes. Right. They're like right. off the charts. A dried apricot. I used to have, um, I think it was apricot or dried mangoes from Costco. So they have this bag of dried mangoes from Costco. And they're through the roof. It's like 37 grams of carbs for like a serving, which is like one bite. I used to like wolf down. So good. <laughs> so good, right? It's like, I mean, it's, it's like- crazy. TikTok. I can't have it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not even still. I when I go to Costco, I'm bummed that I can't eat those. <laughs> so bad. They're delicious. Yeah. But we're gonna stay away from them. <laughs> no more mango. Yeah, yeah. Just berries. Mm. Berries and apples, right? Apples are good. Apples. Um, oh, Diana said. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. So apple. Uh, so Diana is asking in the chat room over there. Yeah. Back to carbs. Do you not eat oatmeal either? No, Diana. I stopped. Okay. So I I could. So now I could go and have a bowl of oatmeal. If I was going to, I'd have steel cut oats, mm-hmm. and I'd probably make sure that my serving was just of like a, whatever it is, half a cup or a cup of cooked or whatever it was to get those 30 grams. But I wouldn't put a banana. I wouldn't do oatmeal and banana. That's what I used to do, and that would be overstimulating for me. For me, I don't. I don't ever want to. Sorry, I got a little bug on my thing. I don't ever want to go over if I can help it. You know, if I can help it, I want to try to stay around thirty grams per meal, if I can. And I. So here's another quick tip: is basically, if you think about, if you do zero to fifty grams of carbohydrates per day, you'll go into a state of ketosis. Right? That's like if you might hear about ketogenic diet. If you do between 50 and 100 grams of carbs per day, you're gonna, that's weight loss. So you'll lose weight if you're in between 50 to 100 grams of carbs. If you're between 100 and 150 grams of carbs, you're basically, that's like maintenance. But you're probably, you know, you might lose weight, but depending on what you were eating before, you might lose weight. If you were used to doing 250 or 300 grams a day, then for sure 100, 150 is gonna help you lose weight. But, um, um, but that's where I try to stay. I try to stay somewhere between 75 and 150, unless I'm exercising a lot, in which case then I allow myself a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So, and when I say exercising a lot, I mean a minimum two hours, so <clears throat> like a hard run, or if I was doing a half marathon or a marathon, I'll allow myself like a little bit more throughout the day to help my recovery. Okay. So I have a question. Uh-huh. Sure. There's been a lot. Well, first of all, a lot of us on the call have been following the portion fix meal plan. Uh-huh. One of the things that's been on my mind for a few months, and I, I just can't figure out how to transition, is I feel like there's not enough healthy fats for long-term health. I think it's good for weight loss. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I have some people who are now on maintenance, and how to transition them to eating more healthy fats. Is there a certain amount that you look for every day or? Um, I don't, I haven't gone to the point where I feel like I'm over fatting myself. Like I know that's a weird term, but, uh, um, but I feel like as, as long I try to do an avocado a day, um, in my salad and dinner, it's like half of my salad, half of my dinner. Usually I'm ha- I'm having a salad a day usually. So I'm making sure that I'm putting my olive oil on the salad. Um, and then honestly, my snack is nuts. So I really get a lot from, from the nuts and that allows me to not be hungry. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I go hungry cause I just have a, a few nuts. And I think the, the big thing with nuts I'm learning is that if you get them off the shelf and they're salted, there can be a lot of salt. So if you go to like Trader Joe's or something like that, they, you can get, I mean, anywhere you can find them in a bag that are just raw nuts. So if you, I like the salt sometimes, um, it's just a nice taste. <laughs> I don't mind it, but I'll dilute it. So if I get a bag with salt, I'll get two raw bags, mix them all up 
and then that, then that helps me. So I'm not as much salt, but I still get my fat content. And then what are your thoughts on the ketogenic diet? Cause that's like the buzzword right now. Right. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there's there's a, a couple books that I'll recommend, and um, these this this helped me when I transitioned because I did go in and out of ketosis a little bit, and I wasn't tracking it, I wasn't measuring my ketones. But you can get a little breathalyzer thing to measure your ketone production, and I just know because my breath stank, and because I uh, because I knew what I was taking in, so I knew for sure I was under fifty grams. Um, but the there's uh, two doctors that have written two great books. One, uh, it's doctors Volek, V-O-L-E-K, and Finney. I think it's P-H-I-N-N-E-Y. And the books are The Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Living and The Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate um, Performance. Um, so I think that, so, the, so I read, I, I bought both, but I read the, um, um, the, uh, art and science of low carbohydrate, uh, performance because I was an athlete and I'm an athlete and I was much more concerned about that. Those two guys are in ketosis. They, they wrote that and they, they stay in it forever. All the recipes in there are much more along the lines of kind of Atkins where you're kind of higher on the protein and super, super low, obviously on the carbohydrates and way high on the fat. I don't, I, for me, what, what I find it just has been better because frankly, I just don't want to limit, like I like having a little quinoa if I want a little quinoa or, you know, or I don't mind, you know, this, I wouldn't really be having Shakeology if I, if I was in, ketosis because that's 18 grand like this would be it otherwise you know <clears throat> that would pretty much be it so for me i mean it's again i think that goes back to we're an experiment of one and if you wanted to give it a try give it a try see how it felt for you um i will say that there's more and more science coming out about how great the ketogenic diet is for you know things like I mean, from like autism to multiple sclerosis to all kinds of to cancer to all kinds of things. There's a study um, that showed that a five day fast and not no food at all, but it's like very, very, very limited helped cancer patients uh, with their chemo. So they actually assimilated the chemo way better if they fasted for five days before. So there's a lot of science coming out about stuff like that. There's a doctor named Walter, V-A-L-T-E-R is his first name, Longo, L-A-O-L-O-N-G-O. He's a researcher at USC, and he created this three-day or five-day fast um, called El Nutra. I think his, the website is L, the letter L dash Nutra, N U T R A dot com. And that's like, you can only get this if a doctor prescribes it to you, but it's basically you'll, you'd, you'd be in a state of ketosis for sure. Um, so for me specifically, I don't, I'm not necessarily, maybe I'll play with going in and out, but I just don't, I just don't want to be that rigid. <laughs> you know what I mean? If so I had, they, go ahead. With the cancer patients, did they, the ketosis state, was that purely in relation to being in chemotherapy treatment or was that in relation to the cancer cells themselves? Do you know? I, I think it was related to the chemotherapy treatment. I think the okay. chemo, the, the result of the chemotherapy treatment was better if they fasted previously. And that makes sense because they're opening it up for a different absorption process. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah, so that's the thing. I would say if you felt like you wanted to try um, your ketosis for a little while to see how it goes, then go for it if you feel like it's better. I, I think that the, uh, just the lower, for me, the lower carb and the, and the less, the more vegetables, because you can go you're just at a Mother's Day brunch and have three plates of vegetables and then come back and still, still feel hungry. Well, I think what you're talking about coming from my personal standpoint with a number of issues, your type of diet to me is incredibly healthy. Whereas mm -hmm. the keto concept, like if you're talking about just, you know, body fat type of situation, that's one thing. 
But if you're talking heart disease and other internal health items, to me, it seems like the keto diet, or at least in the way that a lot of people are interpreting the keto diet, which mm -hmm. can be the issue as well, right. um, you know, these high fats and things like that, that's counterproductive to other health issues, you know, in a different direction. So that really kind of turns me off of it. And again, it could be because of misinterpretations of it versus the pure interpretation of it. Um, whereas the type of nutrition plan you're discussing is kind of healthy on all fronts. Yes, you're keeping yeah. the fat down and yes, you're keeping yourself lean, but you're also not putting yourself at a higher risk with higher fats, with heart disease and other items. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's that's kind of my goal, right? I mean, that's ultimately yeah, is, full uh, health, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah. not just like A, B, or C. You want the whole alphabet. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh Christine, yes, I am. So that's exactly right. So she asks, uh, am I following more of a paleo diet? Yeah, pretty much. I would say that I'm like and it's funny because uh, you guys know who Mark Sisson is. Mark Sisson is the paleo blueprint guy and uh, Primal Kitchen, if you've ever seen, like the, he has now avocado mayonnaise. Anyway, he's a local Malibu guy and he's been around for years. He's been writing Mark's Daily Apple. It's a blog and there's a lot of great information on there. I'm actually um, working with him on a couple things. But he helped me get through the change from my transition. And he's like a paleo expert for sure. And I was talking to his wife and I said, I'm kind of like a paleo pescatarian or like a pescatarian paleo person, right? Because I don't really do meats. Most people think paleo is a lot of meat, but I don't do meat, but I do do fish and I do eggs. So, but I really don't do any grains at all. So for me, it's, it's, it's much, it's basically kind of, you know, the vegetarian paleo almost, you know, like a pescatarian paleo. So yes, Christine, that's correct. Ted, thank you so much. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, you, you answer, you, like, you know, it's like I said in the beginning, there's so much different, there's so much information out there. And, you know, we read one thing and then we read something else. So it, it, it was, it was so, uh, what's the word, I don't know, refreshing, inspiring to hear from someone that's, you know, been in the industry so long and that you're a, a, this premier athlete and, um, I just, I, I really thank you for your time. I really oh, do. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. One my pleasure, you guys. And, and, uh, and thanks for inviting me into your group. Yeah. I hope that, uh, it continues to go well. And, uh, <laughs> next week we I, have you, Ted, we're working out with you next week. <laughs> I said, get ready for Ted. Yeah, really I, well. Ted, I will, pr I love your week and I love, I, I just told Laura, I think it was last night that, um, I absolutely love, and now knowing your full background, I understand where it's coming from because mm -hmm. it kind of, hit a lot of check marks in my boxes i love the way you get into the physiology oh cool oh, good. Those little physiology tidbits like are right yeah. up my alley they make me very happy so keep those coming <laughs> oh you got it you got it you got it i love um, that you do it in, in a bathing suit which is right <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my husband did the work on me he's like all right i can do it this guy's in his bathing suit i can i can do this <laughs> <laughs> that's funny um yeah and i'll i'll check in with you guys and i'll just keep you know because i i check my notifications so i see when you guys are posting in your facebook group so i'll keep in there and please feel free to use me as a resource you know I when so you know it. when it's over or not i mean if just find me on social media uh, teddy mcdonald on instagram and the the fan page on facebook but in the group friend me that's totally fine i i still have i'm i'm, I'm not I'm not like, well, sorry, I have too many friends now. I can't accept anybody. I still have plenty of, plenty of space for friends in my life. Can I, ask one, can I ask one last question? I'm sorry. No, it's fine. So as you're talking about all the different carbs, one thing I notice is that if I don't plan ahead, I can end up eating a lot of carbs on this three-week yoga retreat because yeah. if I have the oatmeal for breakfast and then I have – I don't know, you know, you know the meal plan, but if I don't look at it closely, I can end up eating a lot of carbs in a day. So do you feel like we need to be mindful of that as we're planning yes. our day? I was going to ask that. Yeah. yeah. So I would, I mean, if I, if, if, if I were going to follow this to a T, there are some things that I wouldn't do. Okay. You know, and, and I, I can't, I can't pick them off. I mean, you know, you have a, a you know, a snack, an avocado snack is mm -hmm. like, that's amazing. Right. And you have the, but, but this here, which is a quinoa bowl with sweet potatoes and uh, beets 
I might, I might just do more. Like I might do the bowl on top, not the bowl on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So the bowl on top has the sweet potatoes and the beets. The bowl on the bottom includes quinoa. I might, I might mix the quinoa. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm all for, uh, just doing those little kinds of tweaks to help, you know, and, and then if you're really counting and you said, well, this day I'm going to do the oatmeal, but I'm not going to do the quinoa in the bowl. But then the next time you could reverse it and then, excuse me, have some berries for breakfast and then do the quinoa in the bowl. Right. So you can, you can do stuff like that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You guys are ahead of the game for even thinking about this stuff. Right. There's, <laughs> There's a lot of thinkers like, in this group, Ted. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, it's so, I mean, all you got to do is look around, right? I live in a friggin' bubble. Yeah. I'm in Malibu and I look around my yoga class. I'm like, there's nobody who needs my help here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they do. Come to they New do. York and Virginia. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know when we're supposed to be there, but we, I was supposed to go. Oh, this is horrible. I have a friend who had a tragedy in his family. So we're heading to Florida next oh. week. But that's why I was all touch and go. I was trying to get to you guys for the yeah. test group, but it didn't happen. But we'll probably be there this year. And, and uh, oh, my, my aunt, so my parents both passed away back in 2005 and 2007, but my aunt lives in Farmingdale. Oh, so whenever that's we right go back, yeah. we're always, yeah, yeah, we're always out in Farmingdale. And then my brothers are all in New York City, so we're, all, we're always out there kind of awesome. up and around. Okay. So yeah. hopefully that'll yeah, happen. Some, some of us are on Long Island. Like I'm in Huntington, which is not that far from Farmingdale. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Not that far. All right, Ted, thank you again so much. I'm actually going to put, um, I, I, I'm going to look for your wife's blog and I'll put it in the, I'll put her link in the group. Great. So this way, you know, if, you know, we can all read it. And um, I, again, I so appreciate you, you know, giving your time. I know it's family time, so I'm not going to take up too, too much of your time. I'm, I'm actually recording this, so I'll put it in the group and I'll put it on YouTube. And Oh, perfect. And I'll tag you. So if you want to, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, and if you guys, you know, my wife's pretty good. If you wanted her uh, in the group, I'm sure she would oh, be yes. happy to to you get in there. So. Absolutely. You know, I'll make you an admin if you want to add her. That would be wonderful. We'd love. Oh, to sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Perfect. Okay, cool. Thanks so much, you guys, and uh, good luck and keep it up. And I look forward to. So, so are you guys on the schedule that Monday yeah, starts can. my Monday week? Starts Ted. We are going yes. with you, Ted on Monday. Yes. Right. Week. <laughs> take our picture. <laughs> that's right that's right I, I can't wait i gotta i i look forward to it i look forward to seeing yeah. what happens to you on monday <laughs> and, and, you know, and if you want to do another round like you you even get deeper like you could do another round of this and still get something like even more out of it that's what i'm yeah oh absolutely oh for sure i've been doing yoga it's actually been more than 10 years it's been since i've been teaching for 15 16 wow. practicing for almost 20 and i still you know, you need it. It's just something for me. That's now medicine for me. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Awesome. All right, you guys. Thanks okay, so thank much. Yeah. All See right. You good next night, time. guys.